Hi, this is Jazz Obrick, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast featuring my May 27th, 1986 interview with Tom Petty. This one has kind of an interesting backstory. My uh, deal with MCA Records was I would fly down to Hollywood to their, their offices and do an interview with Tom Petty and with Mike Campbell. And when I showed up that morning, uh, they put me in an office and brought in Mike Campbell, and we did our interview. And as Mike and I were speaking, I could see through a glass door that Tom Petty was in the next room sitting on a couch. And so when, when uh, Mike and I wrapped things up, the publicist came in and I said, uh, let's do the interview with Tom now. And she, and she said, we're sorry, uh, you're only going to be able to get the interview with Mike. And I decided I'd hold my ground and I said, listen, we made a deal to do both people. And so if you don't get me the interview with Tom Petty, you're going to, you're the one who's going to have to explain to Mike Campbell why we're not going to run his interview either. And so she huffed out of the room and a few minutes later she came back in and she said, okay, you can talk to Tom, but here's the deal. You got 15 minutes. You can't talk to him about drugs or you can't talk to him about sex. I'm like, yeah, okay, great. So a few minutes later, Tom Petty comes walking in the room and closes the door behind him. And I said, I guess, uh, they're afraid I'm going to ask you the wrong question. And Tom, bless his heart, basically said, screw him. <clears throat> and he pulled up his chair so close to me that our knees were actually touching and our, his face was about three feet away from mine. And he says, we can talk about anything you want. And from there, I th believe he asked me about uh, drugs and my sex life. And we ended up speaking for more than 40 minutes. And I have to say, I wasn't the world's biggest Tom Petty fan before I went into that room. But after I uh, got done with the interview, I've been a fan ever since. I found Tom to be extremely charismatic, intelligent, just a, a great guy to be around. So without further ado, here's a recording of the conversation as it came down that early afternoon in 1986. Hope you enjoy it. People seem a little oh, nervous no. and I'm going to ask the wrong question. Yeah, I'm nervous. I got nothing to hide. Ask me anything. Great. Let's talk about fucking. Okay, you want to. <laughs> Who you been fucking? Fuck you, you're there. Alright, well that's out of the way. Okay, uh, what's the appeal of working with, uh, with Mike Campbell? The appeal? Yeah. What's he offer you as a musician? Well, he's the best, you know. I mean, he really is the best, you know. I, I, I've played with Michael since 1970, so I wouldn't understand playing with anybody else, you know. I really think he's the best in, in you know, in rock and roll that there is. You know, if you ask a guitar player, they'll tell you. Um, there's a lot of things, you know. Well, we're partners and we're friends and we write together and we play together. We developed the whole style of playing together, actually. Uh -huh. Are, are you, do you consider yourself a rhythm specialist while Mike's more of the soloist? Uh, yeah, well, of course, yeah. Yeah, I, lately I play a lot more solos since I broke my hand. You know, when I was going through the therapy to get my hand together, uh -huh. I, I learned a, a lot of uh, lead playing that I, you know, I don't know why I've never done it before. Uh -huh. I just, but, you know, when I was doing my therapy, I got into that. And so, like, uh, with Bob and stuff, uh, I, I play a lot more solos and, and on this record and stuff, but we, we have a way of just sort of playing together, you know, nobody... It just all, you know, like people think a lot of times that you know, we get comments that, you know, when people thought that, you know, the records were like the six guitars or something, but it's really only two. You know, we, we can make a lot of noise, the two of us. Hey, uh, do you ever have uh, to work, do you usually work stuff out naturally or do you ever... Uh Tell him not to play a certain solo, or does he suggest rhythms to you? No, we never talk about that stuff. No, it's not that kind of band where you could really talk about. You know, nobody really knows who's going to take a solo most of the time. Or uh, no, uh, no, maybe, you know, maybe in a rare occasion. But this kind of band, I mean, if, if you're going to work it out, it's over. 
It's just got to happen. Does he inspire you? Oh, yeah, sure. I'd be lost without him. I'd be lost without him. He's uh, an integral part of this band. Do you uh, uh, ever take solos on records? Oh, yeah, sure. Can you, can you name a couple? On the records? Yeah. I think most people think that Mike does most of them. Well, he does most of them. Uh, Between Two Worlds, I play a great solo on uh -huh. After Dark. I'd have to think for a minute to remember. But most of them are usually Mike or two of us at once, you know, that sort of thing. What do you think it uh, takes to be a good rhythm guitar player? It's a dying art, I tell you. It's a very yeah. important trip, yeah, and a lot of people miss it. You know, a lot of these kids today, they just learn all these Richie Blackmore things, you know, but they don't know a fucking chord to say to the life, you know. They don't know how to write a song, they know how to play a solo. Uh, there's a lot to rhythm. Like, you know, I can carry a band. I can make a band chug along. Um, that's an important thing. If I don't play, there's a difference. You know? were, you, um, were your musical hero, heroes as a kid rhythm guitar players? Well, I like a lot of guitar players, but I did, I've always liked uh, Lennon. I, 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 you know, basically just studied Lennon's play, and I, you know, even in the films, just watching his right hand and how it worked. Uh, stuff like And I Love Her, if you ever listen to that, it's an amazing rhythm pattern. I think I learned a lot from learning that and watching him in the film, you know. This, uh, Keith Richard is another person that uh, always, you know, which I learned a lot from him. Uh, Dylan, actually, you know, since I've been playing with him, the two of us can play rhythm really good and sing. Uh, there's a lot to being a rhythm player that people don't. Uh, it's kind of like being a line on a football team, you know. But uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, are there other players that, that you'd suggest somebody listen to? Or? As a rhythm player? Yeah. Fogarty's a good rhythm player. Uh, Slim Harco's amazing. Amazing rhythm player. Uh, if I think for a minute, I'll probably think of some more. Uh, you know, of course, Lennon, Keith, Dylan on acoustic can't be beat. Um, you know, I played a lot of bluegrass too and country oh, yeah. stuff. And uh, yeah, Michael actually turned me on to that about 1970, 71. We, we had a little country group, one of the first ones ever with long hair. And uh, we did that, and I'm really glad we did that because. We learned a lot of guitar stuff, you know, and in bluegrass you have to play pretty fast and precise in the rhythm. Uh, you know, so that helps a lot, you know. And if you, you listen to any like Bill Monroe, any of that yeah. stuff, yeah, there's a lot, you know, integral rhythm patterns that are really important. In the studio, do you uh, play guitar and sing at the same time? Yeah, we do everything live. This last album we've done is a double album. Right. Uh, every there's, there's maybe three overdubs in the entire album. Everything was live. But on, on previous studio albums, do you like lay, lay down your rhythm tracks and then sing on top of them? No, I sing and play at the same time. I can never do it separately the right way. I mean, I've done that, but it's never as good as just doing it. You, know? so you, nev you never wanted to front a band without playing? No, I started as a player. I, I started as a bass player, actually, for years. Right. Yeah. And it was only when I joined the Heartbreakers that I, I went over to playing guitar all the time. I'd always played the guitar, I always wrote, uh -huh. you know, but nobody else wanted to play the bass, so I was always playing the bass. Right. But, you know, I'm still doing, I do a little bit now with Bob, you know, all of us play the bass at one point in the show, we just have to. What's working with Bob? I mean, has that had an effect on your own musical uh, style? Or? I think it freed us up a bit. I think it got us back on the... I don't know, really, you know, it's too early to really, I'm sure it has. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but the main thing it's done, the uh, main thing that's going on with us is that where we, we took three years off, and then the last two, we've been consistently working and playing. And with Bob, uh, one of the things that went on there, uh, probably in the rehearsals and the sound checks, and this, I mean, we've been playing four and five hours a night, and just playing, and playing, and playing, and playing. I mean, we played so much together recently. We, we kind of feel funny if we don't play. Yeah. Uh, 
So I think that affected this album. This album is all written on the spot in the studio and done. And probably our best album, you know. Maybe we should have been doing that all along. I don't know. How would you compare your rhythm style with Dylan's? Well, I think that, that they're, they're probably different. When I'm playing with him, I, what I'm trying to do is, is uh, get in exactly in sync with what Bob's doing. Yeah, not, that's, a, that's a challenge because it's going to change every night and it's never going to be the same. And sometimes you have to find where the one is, you know, or what exactly this is about. But we've gotten where the two of us, especially on acoustics, can really lock up, you know, and make the band happen. And electrics. Do you, uh, when you write, do you uh, come up with chord progressions first? Mm, there's no pattern. You know, I might, or I might have some words, or I might have nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you never can tell. What determines uh, on stage whether you use the Strat or the Rickenbacker? Well, I haven't used the Stratocaster in a while. Um, What's the appeal of Rickenbackers, then? Well, I love the, uh, this is one Rickenbacker, well, it's two Rickenbackers that I play most of the time. One's a 12-string, uh -huh. which I've, you know, played forever. Was that Campbell's? No, that's mine. It's uh -huh. a... It's a blonde, hollow body 12 string. And the other one is a red hollow body 6 string. It's a great rhythm guitar. More like an electric acoustic almost. Uh -huh. uh, and then the rest of the time with Bob, I've been using Gibson's uh, um, 335 and uh, what is it called? SG, the little red flat thing. What's the, where, do, where, where do you route your guitar into? Do you use any effects? No, just a wire. And you go into the... To a box, I guess 30. Or a camel. We don't have any effects. We don't even like guitars that have been fucked with, you know. I won't have no guitar that's had some little switch put on it. When did you first uh, get into Rickenbackers? Was it because of the birds in the I was 14 or 15. The first guitar I had, I think, the first electric one. It's a Rickenbacker. Did you have to change your way of setting the guitar up after you broke your hand? Uh, no. I did come back playing the Rickenbacker a lot of the set because it was easy to play it out my hand strong. I had to set it up uh, differently. I got the impression from the video when you talked about breaking your hand and the doctor said you probably wouldn't play again. Um, we get letters from other guitar players and that, something like that happens to you. Um, can you give any advice? somebody when that happens to them? Well, if that should happen to you, um, I hope it doesn't. Uh, you just have to remain optimistic is the only advice I can give. I I never accepted that I wasn't going to play again. No, I refuse to accept that. You can't accept that. You know, and neither would uh, the surgeon. You know, he didn't want to have that attitude. That was a reality. It was beyond playing. It was having the use of my hand at all. Did you break the bone over here? Uh, see, you see the scar down the back here? Right down the back. Yeah, I broke all these bones in half. Oh, I see. Here. So I had, my hand was closed like a cloth. It wouldn't open. Like uh -huh. It was like that for nine months. Have uh, you recovered full use? Yeah, I'm full use. Yeah, I have some, some pain there now and again. Yeah. Okay. I have four pieces of metal and this little wire. And stuff. Did it affect the way you play at all? I think I got better as a lead player because I I just spent, you know, I went through all this therapy and, and once I had the movement of my fingers, the doctor made me play guitar all day because that's what, you know, he's going to ultimately do. Uh -huh. And we figured that was the best therapy after the electro shock and all that awful shit. Uh, so I had to play guitar literally all day, you know, sometimes when it hurt. And it was just all this stuff just started to, I just started to find things. And, it's interesting. It's interesting, yeah. Stuff that I never would have, I never had been there all the time, and I just never thought about doing it. Do you do you play in any styles that never uh, show up on any of your albums? Well, I don't. Know. I think there's a lot we do that hasn't shown up on the albums. I think we're uncovering that more and more as time goes by. I can play country pretty good, you know, and uh, I'm a pretty good blues player. I, well, actually, we we play a lot of blues on this record, so I, I think I probably play a lot more guitar. I mean, you know that you notice on this record because there's only two guitars on the record uh -huh. one over here and one over there 
So our one of us falls down, the other one jumps in. Right? <laughs> That's what we do with Bob when we got three people going for a lead. You never yeah. know who's going to play a lead, right? So everybody dives in and he starts backing out when we realize who's got the biggest fish. You know? yeah. Do you play much acoustic guitar? Constantly, all day long. Was that what you learned on? Mm, not really. Uh, I, I, I had acoustic, but the strings were so high I couldn't get anywhere. So when I got an electric, then I learned more. But I mean, for 10 years or more, that's that's what I play all really? the time. Yeah. What kind of, what's your favorite? Uh, J200 acoustic, uh, Gibson. Do you write songs on that? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, almost all the songs are, I, except, you know, if, if I'm maybe writing in the studio, I might use an electric, but the, the, most of them were uh, written on my uh, Gibson Dove and uh, the J200. Do you, what kind of strings do you use on those? You know, the famous kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. Don't know. Um, what, what's your work? Where, what is about it? to put some on? <laughs> I don't like to change strings very often. On the electric, I don't like to change them the whole tour. Really? Yeah, I don't like. I, I, I never let them change strings on my 12 string, ever. You know, a lot of people don't understand how to make a 12 string work. You know? Yeah. Uh, like, they're always up there nosing around trying to figure out what I'm doing to it. You know. But I'm not doing anything to it. It's just the way you play it. It's just uh, Nick Lowe used to every night, you know, be up there thinking that I had some little box somewhere. I mean, it was a running joke. You know? <laughs> uh, but all it is is an AC30 and a Rickenbacker 12 string, a very old one. Yeah. But uh, if you put new strings on them, there's no way that you're going to control them because they're very thin and they at least spread out. But when the strings are really old and thick and dead, it's when you know you get that that thickness. And you must not sweat a lot or corrode them. Very oh good. yeah, they do awful. <laughs> That's an embarrassment, really. Do you own many guitars? Yeah. I, I have no idea how many guitars I own. <laughs> Bugs brings around trunks of them. And, uh, I know which ones are good, though. <laughs> in the song The Waiting, you have one of the, the beautiful, uh, pure Rickenbacker tones. I wonder if you'd mind talking about how you uh, set up your equipment to get that sound. That's just my blonde Rickenbacker. Which pickups? Uh, one? the treble pickup. Going into the AC30? That was a box Super Beetle on that record. Yeah. What, what's your method of, acoustic, of uh, miking an acoustic guitar on stage? Oh God, it's, I haven't found a good one. <laughs> uh, last tour I used uh, one of Bob's guitars, the uh, Yamaha. That had an electric pickup. Acoustic up. electric? Yeah. One of the so we used the same model, both of us. These kind of little, they look like little J200s. Yeah. And those sounded pretty good. We're still looking around. I'm, I, I'm trying to get the J200 uh, amplified for this tour. I saw Neil Young, I saw him, and he had uh, a great rig on his Gibson. It's the best one I ever heard. And then all you can do is. It's hard to mic them in those big places, you know, football field, it's yeah. just ridiculous. How do you do it in the studio? In the studio, uh, what I've been doing is working out rather well because I have a tendency to back away from the mic and be all over the places. I just put a little contact mic, clip it onto the hole, and then we put a microphone kind of around uh, right where the neck and the body join. Uh -huh. And we just do a split off the two. I'm not sure the name of the mic, it's just a little tiny thing that, that clips on it. What, what's in your work as a producer? What's your work as a producer taught you about getting a good electric guitar sound? Well, it's essential. The, the trip is with the guitar. You could stay there and bang your brains out all day, but if it ain't going on, it just ain't going on. The guitar's got to sound good right there. The real the coming secret, out of the amp. You mean? Yeah, the secret to that, to any sound in the studio, is to have something that makes a good sound. If, uh, I've seen so many people go, oh, this don't sound good, you know, why don't sound? Well, it don't sound good because it don't sound good, you know, and nothing, you can do everything in the control room is no good. Yeah. Uh, basically, you got to have an amp and a guitar that sounds good. Do you find that, uh, I've heard guys say that if they record at a quieter volume, the part sounds bigger on the record. Have you found that to be true? I think it's all down to the noise that's coming out. Um, I just turn the amp up to where it sounds like I want it to sound, and then if everything's done right, it should sound that way inside. You know, um, 
I don't think there's any rule to like if some I don't know I don't buy that I, I think that you've got to have if you want an exciting sound then you got to have the amp loud to make that sound maybe if you got a little amp everybody's got a different theory yeah but the uh, the most successful ones are the guys that know like Michael has this amp called, it's an Ampeg rocket and he uses that quite often it's a tube amp. And that thing sounds great. I don't care what room you put it in. Turn that thing on and it sounds like that, you know. Um, but when it's not going on, the best thing to do is just, you know, take a look at your equipment. You know, maybe you're in the wrong part of the room or something, but I would just try to find, uh, it's the same with the drums and everything. When they sound really good, it's a simple thing. Yeah. You know, usually the problem is more in the, in the room rather than, in the control room. Why do you like box amps? I'm just used to them because I've played them all my life. And uh, they, they tend to work very well for us. Uh, I don't know, there's probably other good amps. We, we, we haven't had much luck with Fenders uh, or Marshalls uh, occasionally. The box is a... And then with these AC-30s are great. They're making new AC-30s now that are great. You know? Um, I uh, gave one to Bob, you know, he's playing one now, he can't believe it. Hmm. They, they, they sound great, they make them just like the old ones. There's two different kinds, one's better than the other, I can't remember and which one it is. <laughs> and uh, they have a very rich sound, they have a nice tremolo and reverb, right? they very simple. Mm -hmm. um, the Super Beetle, uh, I like that, I played that a long time, but it's really a loud amp and, and uh, sometimes a little hard to deal with because it's just too loud, even yeah. in a big place. Are the older songs that you're covering in concert and on record a reflection of your uh, favorite songs when you were a kid? Sure, yeah. Well, they, they, they're usually things that uh, everyone knows, you know, that we play at the soundtrack or... Did you play uh, any of these songs in high school or... Oh, yeah. Don't Bring Me Down. Come so. on, yeah. It's 15. It's embarrassing. A lot of your, a lot of your audience probably never heard the originals. No, which is probably a good reason to play them now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I never heard like you know Buddy Waters until I heard Stone was doing it, and uh, I'd go back and look that shit up. You know? Yeah. So I'm very uh, indebted to a lot of those groups to turn me onto a whole other thing. Yeah, I understand you played with Mighty one night. Yeah, I did. That, that, was, that was a real thrill. Fantastic. He's an amazing guy. Yeah, and he's one of the I never I never thought he'd be that good on slide live. I saw him right before he died and I just Oh, he was top of the heap when I mean I We were it. astonished. I was astonished too, you know. I was really astonished. And uh, we played quite a while and that was a, it was a real real thrill because we didn't go to the club we had no idea even though we were. <laughs> What would, what would you most like to uh, improve about your playing? Well, I just like, you know, keep learning more. Uh -huh. you know? uh, there's, the nice thing about the guitar is that no matter how long I play it, there's always something sitting right there, you know? That's, a, that's one thing like playing with Michael sometimes, you know. I'll say, how'd you do that? And I'll look at the way he did it, and I'll go, like, oh, yeah, I had never thought about that, you know? Uh, and See, then maybe that'll open up a whole another thing for me. I'm you know, just seeing one different formation or uh, something. I'll go, ah, oh, yeah. There's always something else to learn. That's the real thrill of it. Do you ever feel like you're in a rut or do you feel stale with your point? Yeah, I don't think about that. I'm trying to get off. <laughs> <laughs> do you use a pick? Yeah. How, do you do anything special? Fender mediums. Sometimes I use my fingers if I have to, you know, uh, with the pick mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I'm a pretty good finger picker. I can do that pretty well. Uh, what are you, have you ever recorded outside of the Heartbreakers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've played on some people with albums. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was uh, Steve and Nick's. I mean, I I'm playing know. guitar more than singing. I think I play guitar. I remember there's a guy named Dwight Twilley. Sure. I used to play on their albums. <laughs> And uh, playing on this album, Bob's got coming out. Uh -huh. um, but think for a minute, I'll probably think of a few. <laughs> if you could jam with any musician, past or present, 
Is there anyone who comes to mind? That I've never played with? Yeah, or could talk to. Yeah. Oh, well, let's think for a minute. You mean just to play with somebody? Uh, I've never played with. I've played with a lot of them. <laughs> I'd love to play with Johnny Cash. Or, uh, Johnny Hooker, somebody like that. Um, he'd be a tough one to follow. Yeah, he gets rid of it, just drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that, I just get, you know, fever and chills. You know? Yeah. Um, Johnny Hooker, uh, there's so many people I admire. So many good is players. It, is the simplicity of rhythm guitar what appeals to you? It sounds like the musicians you admire are hard. Well, we never think of it really as rhythm and lead too much. You know, like I, I got the freedom to play over the last couple of years. Like we, we keep it very free. If I want to start playing lead or start playing another part or something, I just do it. Uh -huh. Or if I want to stop playing altogether, <laughs> you know, I just do it and trust that it's going to keep going. And, and once that freedom's there, the music's much more exciting than if everybody, okay, you're going to play this and you're going to play that. You know, that, that's a little limiting. You need to. You've got to have that discipline yeah. to know when you must do that. But uh, I, I, I think that, you know, that kind of just confidence in each other yeah. is real important. That's essential for a band. Well, it's just, you know, you, you hit an energy level and you try to um, just get lost in that. And hopefully that's going to get the song out. Then the song's going to do the work. If you're playing a good song, you're all right. Yeah. In trouble when you're not, because <laughs> there's, there's really nothing the fuck you can do about it. Yeah. Um, but if it's a good song and, and, and you get the song over, we think about so you know we're real song oriented. We don't think yeah. of guitar much. We think song. If you had a kid and wanted to be a guitarist or a friend, what would you uh, suggest that they emphasize when they were learning? Well, I would just try to have a um, a good understanding of the just basic uh, say chord structures that make up most popular songs is a good place to start you know learning the old four chords uh, the old C A minor F G I you know, know what the minor is you know what the, there's another minor that fits into this key and I, and I would just learn a lot of songs the, 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 what you have to do that most people can't do these days, most of these kids, is uh, I, I kind of like to, to think that I can pick up a guitar and sing your song, you won't miss anything. You know? Yeah. Uh, I think that's the test of whether you've written a song or not. You should be able to sit down at the piano or pick up the guitar and perform that song to someone. And uh, what an interesting one. If you can do that, yeah. Even songs I've written like Don't Come Around Here No More, which is a very complex record, I can sit at the piano and play that song and uh -huh. get it over to you. Or play it on the guitar. And uh, the ones you can't do that with, you know, like, you know, uh -huh. better keep a close eye on. Do you have much of a background in music theory? I don't know anything about music theory at all. Uh, I've learned a lot of like lingo over the years. Yeah. I don't know what a five is, for instance. You know, I hear him say, you play a one, four, five. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what that is. Do you, uh, know, a lot of, <laughs> do you know a lot of different yeah. chord inversions? I know millions of chords. I, I could tell you the names of them. Uh -huh. But I usually know what key I'm in, which is more than Howie does. Uh, <laughs> you know, Howie can play anything with strings on it, literally anything. Yeah. Still has the fucking faintest idea what the names of it. No, it's not what you can say. <laughs> Gee, and you're like, is this one? Uh, to this day. I'm not that bad. But I've learned it. You know, I like from just songwriting, I, I know a lot of things like these chords fit into this key, or I can move into this key from this key and back to this key, or like, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. From that and the piano. Um, I write a lot on the piano too, so 
I guess in that sense, I know music theory. I don't uh, really know, you know, I've never had any instruction or... Have you ever discovered a chord progression on the guitar that just sparked a song like that? Oh, yeah, all the time. Got any examples? The Waiting. When you mentioned uh, that came with the, the riff you hear at the intro. Uh, I wrote that on my 12 string. And then that came down, the song was in the back. Do you ever get ideas when you don't have an instrument in your hand? Yeah, sure. For chords and stuff? Yeah. I'm kind of here up my head. You see, I think I value not knowing what I'm doing. Like sometimes Michael will say, well, you know, this song's exactly like this Buddy Holly song or something, you know. Yeah. And I'll say, well, I didn't know that. I don't give a shit about that. That if I get hung up worried about that, I don't do anything. Yeah. So let's go on and do it. And if it's a total embarrassment, then then we'll back <laughs> off. But usually by the time you're done, it doesn't sound anything like that anyway. Yeah. So I, I like not knowing, kind of. Well, some musicians claim when they go to another instrument, like from guitar to piano, they know so little they can write stuff because they're not That's hindered true. by their knowledge. Well, it's true that in guitar, if, if you're in a rut, you might tend to go to the same things all the time. You can maybe walk over to the piano and start to play that song with the, uh, the luxury of being able to play a bass line against the chords. Something else happens. My, my best piano songs are all based off mistakes. Which came first for you, guitar or piano? Guitar. I had to kind of teach myself to piano. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I've gotten pretty. They let me play on some of the records on the piano sometimes. But I... I can only really play one rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> so are you working on uh, any new guitar techniques and things? Just doing stuff I'm just now? trying to keep it rocking, you know. Uh, I would, I've never think of those terms of working on a guitar technique. Yeah. I just think of trying to get it over. Or trying to amuse myself, you know. Try to get into what I'm playing. Something that fits with the band. I just try to lock up the band. It's yeah. my job. Like it's going to all fall in. It's my job to lock this baby up and keep it locked. Then if that means upbeats or if that means flamenco or if that means yeah. uh, you know, calypso, yeah. that's what I got to do. Do you prefer playing in the studio to the stage or vice versa? Mm, I like them both. Um, they're getting to be more and more the same since we're cutting so live now anyway. Yeah. I love you. The stage always has the advantage of an audience. How would Some you feedback? Yeah. You know. How would you like to be remembered as in terms of your music? How would I like to be remembered? Yeah. Uh, fondly. <laughs> <laughs> as a songwriter or a musician or doesn't it? Oh, I think they'll probably remember much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they could forget some of the trouble I've been in. You know, maybe just focus on the music I've done. Yeah. Are you enjoying touring after? I'm having a marvelous time. Yeah. Uh, this is maybe the best couple of years musically I've ever had. Yeah, it's certainly good time. Southern accent. So. Well, the great thing about it is, is there anybody thinking about anything about nothing but playing? Mm -hmm. We're just really happy to be playing and grooving on it. Yeah. I think that has a lot to do. There's not any tension, though. You know, I mean, maybe we just hit the point where we don't care. <laughs> don't You've been know. through a lot. You've been through more than most players. We've been through a lot. In terms of snags and not. We get in a lot of trouble. Uh, I have a tendency, you know, over the years, I, I just... You know, it's a running soap opera, but I... <laughs> Michael says that I have a problem with authority. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I just don't think about that anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to just play some rock and roll music. I really love rock and roll music. That's I can honestly say that I really love the music. And I have since I was very young. <laughs> since I was a child, 10 or 11. So I'm good for it. I guess it's... Uh, so it means a lot to me. I mean, I, I just want to make, make sure that it, it's still around. I think that's the most important thing we're doing is keeping that music alive. Yeah. I think that if, if us and a few other people hadn't come along in that period in the mid-70s, 
You might not have never heard this shit again. It was a wasteland, wasn't it? You might not have ever heard it again. And it wasn't no easy battle to get it on the radio. Yeah. Are you thinking of uh, working any more old, older tunes into your uh, act? Well, there'll always be one or two. I'm not interested. I'm more interested in writing songs with that spirit. Yeah. Uh, the album I've done, this one that's going to come out, is very much like songs that we would play at a sound check, say. It's very much like that. They're all made up off the top of my head. Most of the takes are the band not even knowing what's going on. It's just very interesting. Like uh, Michael was saying, like, we listen to the playback of these songs. Sometimes you've only ever heard the song five times. You don't even know what's going to happen next when, when it's playing. That's very interesting. But that spontaneity really adds a life to the music, doesn't it? Oh, it's essential. It's essential for us. If it takes you too long to record a song when you scrap it, do you ever get uh, tired of it? Well, we know how to do. We we've done this so long together. Like it's we we record everything ever played in the studio, the whole session. If one yeah. guy's playing, if two guys are playing, everything's recorded. We, there's very uh, it's very rare that we ever do a take past two takes that it's kept. Yeah. Because it just doesn't sound the same. So what I'll do then, I, and I won't play the same song all night anymore. You know? that, 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 that's nowhere. It doesn't work for us. So what I'll do is if, uh, I won't necessarily scrap it. Uh -huh. Maybe I'll say, well, let's play a country. Uh, let's play it as a ballad. Or let's, let's not play it. Let's yeah. play Bye Bye Johnny. Or let's play some more songs. Or let's play some sets of this. And then all of a sudden, when no one's thinking, well, hey, how about this one? And then bang, you get it, you know, or you leave it and come back to it another day. But you're never going to get anywhere once everyone's tired and weary with it. Yeah. So, no, I, I've never seen that work. Do you, do you have any favorite Mike Campbell solos? Oh, I got dozens and dozens. Yeah. Yeah, it blows my mind. <laughs> 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 I shouldn't say that. He'll read it. Um, I tell you, some of the, one of my favorites is the one he plays on So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. McGuinn and Hillman called me about that. You know? They did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucked them up. You know? uh, it's hard to do that on a 12 string. You know, it's really hard to play that way on a yeah. 12 string. That's a bit, um, it's like he's playing in the lower position, too. I don't know how he even does that. I don't know even how those notes are. Were, my, were McGuinn, McGuinn and Hillman uh, impressed? Oh yeah, they loved it. Uh, they're big fans of his. Uh, uh -huh. Keith Richards is a big fan. He's been on and on about a long time. I saw Michael playing with the Rolling Stones one time in the rehearsals. Really something to see. But I won't go into that. Yeah, Mike uh, mentioned that. Uh, they, I'll tell you, he's played a lot of great solos, a lot of classic solos. You know, he's very imitated. You know. I really like him on slide. Yeah, that one version of, the best, of Spike in concert was great. Yeah, he can play that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He can play um, the solo and even the losers. I heard that on the radio the other day. I think that's a pretty staggering. I remember Springsteen was sitting there with us when we did that solo, you know. And old Bruce just got religious. We gave him some water and he calmed down. <laughs> but that is a great solo and it's one that was very imitated, you know. I mean, Brian Adams and Mellon Camp, you know, they make a living off Mike Campbell, don't they? I mean, uh, if you listen to those records in that style, you know, Michael is not, a, not one to show off. Yeah. You know, he thinks he's a writer a lot. Which sometimes I have to kick his ass about. You know? yeah. so like, you know, go ahead and give it to him. When you when you perform a song, when you song in concert, do you ever uh, think back to whatever it was that uh, caused you to write it to inspire you to during the performance? Well, yeah, certainly, yeah. 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 Well, you try to get into that character or that frame of mind because you must believe it to convince Did you get? Else. Will you get angry at someone all over again each time you sing it? You can. Uh, it's a lot like acting uh, in a sense that you just have to become that character. Uh, if you if you don't believe what you're saying, the, 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 the jig's up. 
you really can't fool anybody. Not even a, a sixty thousand either. They can do it. You, you just can't hide that. God knows we've tried, right? yeah. but you can't fool anybody. So that's a real trick of performance too, is getting your mind in the shape to take all that on. Do you know uh, what's when you play your best? I think I do. Yeah, I think I do. I I, I think that. I don't know if I always did, but I know. I, I I think I know now from producing. I know what the take was, you know. Yeah. Do you know yeah. when you when you record it? Well, I wish I did. You know. Um, You've had more experience I, I, than most. I I have an inkling, but I'm surprised a lot of the time too. Do you have any favorite songs you've written? Favorite ones. Most close. of my favorite ones now are ones uh, probably no one's heard yet, but on this new album. Um, quite a few, that, but uh, on the old albums, uh, there's quite a few that I, I Southern Accents, I think, is one of the best songs I've ever done. Rebels. That was a real change of pace for you. Yeah, it was. It was. I it was either that or cut my wrist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, this new album is going to be quite a shock too, I think. Um, Rebels, I was real proud of that song. Uh, so some of the sound, ones that weren't as popular, like, let me say, Straight Into Darkness. Uh, yeah. Is one that I like quite a bit. Being, being from uh, Florida, I'm curious why uh, there's not more uh, dual guitar playing, a la the Almond Brothers. That was the, the well, basic southern sound for a while. Did you ever engage in that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, well, we had to play all those songs. You know. we, I think we consciously didn't want to do that because we didn't we want to create our own style. Yeah. Uh, rather than kind of jump on that. Uh, and it's hard, you know, like all you can do is just mix all your influences into a stew, and then the funny thing is that you look up and all of a sudden it's it's your own thing. Yeah. And that that's a real gas, because then you can you know, you can't bomb one sure. you can take it somewhere, you know, do something with it. Yeah. Well it's uh is there anything else you want to cover? Well, no. I mean, I'm really glad you're doing this story on Michael, you know. And we are, too. It's long overdue. Um. <laughs> I just want to see him get... Uh, I mean, he's done so much anyway, but yeah. uh, I would like to see him. I'm amazed at the hooks that guy plays. Oh, he's incredible. Mr. Uh, he's understated, but what he says is real important. Yeah, it's essential. essential. You know, the lick and breakdown. I can't imagine that song without Without that lick, right? You know the story of that lick? Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> I'll bore you with this for a while. When we did Breakdown, this must have been 10, 11 years ago now, I guess. We were, we were doing it. And the first version, I wrote that song in the studio, and we did it. And the first version was like seven minutes long, with this long guitar in the end. Everyone was gone home, right? And I'm sitting there listening, and, and then while it's Dwight Twilley, you know, we were hanging around a lot at the time, because we were kind of the neighborhood oddballs at the time, especially down at Shelter Records, you know, they just yeah. put us in a room and didn't know what to do with us. Uh, <laughs> Twilley walks in, and, and right in the fade out of the song, Campbell plays. He's playing slide. No, it's just straight on finger stuff. He played the lift once and then Twilly turns to me and goes, that's the fucking thing, man. He goes, how come he plays the lift once at the end of the song? It's a whole hook. You know? <laughs> and I listen back and said, you're right. You're right. So I call them all up four in the morning. Back down there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we did it again around the lid and it, it, it uh, took a couple of takes. It took off from there. There it was. Yeah. Um, so he does all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, he had a couple of other ones. Uh, 
Oh, and uh, don't do me in refugee, those things. Well, you could do with one of them. Yeah, which one? Uh, I don't remember. Sometimes I come up with the solo and he plays it. Really? Yeah. Like maybe he'll have an idea and I'll say, and then I play something like, like this. Or I can sing something to him. And then he'll take it and usually improve on it quite a bit. Does he ever suggest uh, chord patterns to you to play or inversions? He might, yeah, he might say, well, you know, since I'm doing this, maybe you, know, you should go up here. Or maybe I should go to open tuning, more of a capo or something, you know. Do you, do you ever play an open tuning? Oh, yeah, a lot. G? All of them, you know, whatever the song requires. We use capos a lot. We have guitars that uh, don't come around here no more as in the key of F. So we're not really showing off changing all those guitars, you know, it's funny. People go, well, why do you need that? But the, the reason you need it, let's say we don't come around here, it's an F tuned to an E formation. So it's tuned up a step, a step across the board. So you can play an E formation and get the full sound because using the bar chords isn't very really effective. Okay, you know, and when you go out in concert, how many guitars do you have out there waiting for you when you go on the stage? Quite a few, usually, just for, you know, between the tuning and the emergency factor. What, what, uh, how many differently tuned guitars will there be? Well, I don't know. With Michael, it's probably, you know, three or four. But with you? With me, uh, only three. You have one standard, one up a step? Yeah. Depends on what's in the cell, you know. Yeah. If there's something that I've got to play open on them. Are there other, what are the, some of the songs you play in open? Oh, there's quite a few, um, you know, Dogs on the Run, uh, there's a song called Shadow of a Doubt, uh, that's all open to me. You know, remember the tunes? I think that, those are open, eh? Hey. Um, damn, I can't remember what I had to, uh, I don't remember, you know, I had to see the sad best. But I've got it narrowed down now to where uh, I don't think you have to use too many guitars. I can usually use my 335 and uh, the two rigs. And then I've got this one solid body rig for Don't Come Around Here. This, two, uh, two, yeah, this is on the last two. And I think I had the Stratocaster for maybe two songs. Yeah, you played one in the movie. Yeah, I did, right. Couple of songs I'd use that strap. Right. Um, that funk tune you do. Yeah, because it just had that kind of sound. Yeah. You couldn't get that out of anything else. Um, and that's about it. That the the, the SGs that I've started using now an awful lot most of the time. In the studio. Yeah, and on the, the last tour we did the Dylan stuff. The that, old SGs. Huh? Yeah, it's an old 60 odd, you know, SG, and uh, I got it right before the tour, and it was like brand new in the case, you know, this uh, old 60s thing. And now Campbell's taking the motherfucker. <laughs> he will. I'm really, been, I'm sort of concerned about getting it back because he's used it the whole album. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but he's got to get it back for the tour. He's got Red Dog too, right? Yeah, he kind of took that. But I took one of his written <laughs> We we do that. I think you guys have a pretty good time. We do, you know. The, we the, there's some guitars that the ownership isn't quite clear. On. <laughs> yeah. And there's some that you know that you can't touch. <laughs> Which is your untouchable. Well, my red Rickenbacker's mine. The one on Gamma Topias? No, that's actually his. That's uh -huh. his 12 string that I was playing for a while now. I'm not allowed to mess with that. <laughs> but, uh, I, I like, well, I, I broke, you know, he used to let me play this clear guitar he had, Dan oh, Arms. So, and I kept breaking it, you know. <laughs> I kept, three times I'd run across the stage and the cord would rip all the cuts out on three, <laughs> on three occasions. And so that was the end of that. And, uh, Are you rough on guitars otherwise? Do you have a heavy approach? Bugs, bugs those were pretty hard on. Do you hit it hard when you play? Oh, yeah. 
We smack them in the amps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that old Stratocaster. I said, this is Telecaster I played for about three tours. I ought to play. I just got tired, you know, and for variety, I put it away. I've been playing it on the album, this old white Telecaster. But that thing, I could get great sounds. I could take that thing and just, you know, boom, against the amp. <laughs> just make this, you know, this great sound. Um, Is there going to be any new directions in your playing on the album you do? It's it's pretty uh, wild this album. I'd say it's, it's untamed. <laughs> <laughs> it's very untamed. It's some great. It's all a lot of guitar. On it. Are you producing? Uh, yeah, me and Michael. Great. And uh, boy, it's you know I think it's really something. I'm really excited about it. It's it's a real I guess rock and roll. It's the most rocking. I hate to use that word, but it's the most rocking thing we've ever done. Great. I mean, you know, people think, they always say, like, you know, I wish they'd made records like they did when they were young or whatever, you know, or the, yeah. those old records, but this is wilder than that shit. Great. Okay, well, you don't want to keep it safe, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks, man. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. No, oh, man. Glad to be here. After the interview, Tom played on many more albums, headline world tours, performed a Super Bowl halftime show, and provided the voice of Lucky Kleinschmidt for the King of the Hills animated TV series. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012 and has been the subject of several biographies. With sales in excess of 80 million albums, Tom Petty ranks among the world's best-selling music artists. Before signing off, I want to express my thanks to the Southern Folklife Collection and my co-producer, Nick Hunt. This podcast is copyright 2022 by Jazz Obrecht. All rights reserved. Thanks for listening.